to a living, breathing, growing example of how people who pull for different football teams can come together on Sunday morning over something so much bigger and better. And wasn't that Georgia Bulldogs game last night awesome? Now I know what it feels like to be an Alabama fan. So anyway... Hey, if you're a guest this morning, thanks for coming out. I hope that it is immediately obvious that there is joy in this place and that we don't take ourselves too seriously, but we do take the Lord very seriously. We're glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. If you are on a journey or just beginning a journey and you're interested in partnering with some folks that are walking a path, we would love to sit down and have a conversation. Glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. There is a card on the uh, back of the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and put it in the collection plate. It'll pass about halfway through our service. And if you have a prayer request, be sure and indicate that on the card. We'll be praying about those first thing tomorrow morning. So we're just really thankful that you're, you've chosen to join us this morning. Glad you're here. Hey, I want to acknowledge a couple of our members who have achieved something significant here. Lynn and Carol Herring uh, have just celebrated 60 years of marriage. You guys stand up so we can give you a hand. There they are. That's awesome. You want to know how it's done? You go talk to Carol. She will tell you how it's done. How it's done. Hey, let's, let's, uh, let's stand together here for uh, our next uh, couple of songs. And uh, here's the thing. If you feel overwhelmed this morning, if you feel overcome by life, if you feel overthrown by problems, overtaken by consequences, I've got good news for you. The kingdom of this world, the kingdom of whatever it is that has overwhelmed you this morning, 
has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Listen to the words of this next song. One phrase in it just really stands out to me. Though the wrong seems often so strong, God is the ruler. Amen. Let's praise the Lord. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world, I rest me in the fall of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, His hand the wonders draw. This is my Father's world, oh, He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises others up. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of Through all eternity, 
Some song. Hey, um, this weekend we had our men's retreat. Or they're still having our men's retreat, and some of us aren't there. Um, but it, it has been really an awesome retreat this weekend. Uh, your husbands, your sons, your fathers. We have some really good men in this church, and uh, we are blessed. And they, they have really been having a great experience, and I just want, to, want you to keep that in your prayers. Um, it was a, just a, an intense weekend, some really great teaching from a guy named Justin Gerhardt out of Texas who was with us, and then even more important than that was time we got to spend together uh, in smaller groups, just connecting with each other, learning more about each other, challenging each other really, really great event. Uh, so keep that in your prayers. just want to let you know that if you don't see some uh, folks that you normally see, they're uh, not too far away from here, and they're doing okay. It's been a great week. Hey, uh, uh, last week we waded into the story of Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or as they are better known by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, And then as we return to the story this week, these four young men have graduated summa cum laude from the Babylonian School for the Enchanted Arts, and they are now full-fledged advisors in the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, who, as we learn in Daniel chapter 2, which is where we are this morning, if you want to follow along, 
Nebuchadnezzar is having a hard time sleeping because he's had some dreams, uh, nightmares, really. And they are, I don't know if he's not sleeping because he's afraid to go to sleep because he'll have the nightmare again. You ever had that before? I've, I've been there. That's not a pleasant place to be. Or if the nightmares have created such anxiety, he just can't sleep. doesn't really matter because either way, his nights are long and his, tempers, his temper is short. You know what happens to people when they don't sleep. Right? They get really, really grumpy. So Nebuchadnezzar calls in his advisors and he says, I've, I've had a dream and it's troubling to me and I want you to tell me what it means. Back then and and in some cases, even today, people believed that a, a dream was a shadow cast by the future. And if you could figure out the shape of that shadow, you could figure out what was going to happen next. And so the advisors are standing there, and Nebuchadnezzar says, I want you to tell me what this dream means. And they say, O king, live forever. Back then, everybody talked in kind of an English accent, as you well know, right? Tell us your dream, and we will tell you what it means. And remember the part about Nebuchadnezzar being grumpy, right? He says, it's not going to work that way this time, boys. This time, you're going to tell me what I dreamed, and then you're going to tell me what it means. And if you don't, then I'm going to basically chop you up into about a million pieces, and I'm going to bulldoze your houses. But if you tell me my dream and what my dream means, then I'm going to make you all very rich and you'll be vacationing in the Turks and Caicos next week. So the advisors are like, um, half the time we don't even remember our own dreams. So you, you tell us the dream, we'll, t we'll tell you what it means. People who don't sleep are not only grumpy, they tend to get a little paranoid. So Nebuchadnezzar is like, I know, you guys are out to get me, aren't you? you really, I, you've been whispering. I see you whispering in the corners around the palace. I know you're out to get me. So the only way I'm going to be able to trust you is if you tell me what I dreamed and then tell me what it means. Otherwise, I'm getting some new advisors. And the advisors, finally, somebody among them, they're, you know, they're pulling at their collars and they're sweating under their robes and somebody finally musters up the courage to really explain to Nebuchadnezzar the reality of the situation. And I want to read it right out of the text because this part is really important. This is in chapter 2 beginning in verse 10. And you should, if you're not there, you should get there. Daniel chapter 2, 10 and 11. Here's, here's what they say. The astrologers answered the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magi magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. Put a pin in that one because we're coming back to that. That's pretty important. Well, Nebuchadnezzar just blows his turban at that, right? So he orders all the wise men in the kingdom to be summarily put to death, and that includes Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Uh, the four young men who have been taken from their home 700 miles away in Jerusalem and forced to matriculate in uh, a Babylonian re-education camp for the last three years. So the head of the Babylonian secret police is a guy named Arioch. And Arioch goes and he knocks on Daniel's door. And when Daniel answers the door, Arioch says, I have a warrant for your arrest and execution by order of King Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel, verse 14 says, Daniel spoke with wisdom and tact. An excellent strategy anytime you're confronted by law enforcement. And Daniel's like, Arioch, man, me and you, we're like, you know, we know each other. What, what's going on? And Arioch gives him the background, and Daniel goes, okay, let me talk to the king. So Daniel goes and talks to the king and says, give me a little time. So he, he gets some time. Time is granted. Daniel goes back 
back home and he calls together his small group, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. By the way, this is a really good place for me to ask, have you joined a small group here at Twickenham? I'm not forcing anything here. Okay, I, just, I think it's interesting that six centuries before Jesus, they, they saw the value of a small group. They embraced it. A group of people that you could pray with and be with and help you through the hard times. Daniel has this small group, and so he, they get together and they pray about it. If you haven't joined a small group yet, talk to Steve Krieger. He can help you with that. He's kind of like our Daniel here, all right? So... Um, they pray together. Another interesting thing to me about what happens here is that when these three guys are together, these four guys are together, they, they refer to themselves by their Hebrew names, not their Babylonian names. Check this out. Go back and read the text, the first six chapters of Daniel. Whenever they're described in their, in their royal positions as their official government function, they're called Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Belshazzar. When it's just talking about them in their relationships with one another, when they're talking about themselves and to themselves, they refer to themselves as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The reason for that is, I think, because they're trying to hang on to their identity. They're living as exiles in a foreign land, and they're trying to hang on to their identity. Their culture is against them. Everything about their culture is trying to undermine their faith, and they're trying to hang on to their identity. Every one of their names, every one of their Hebrew names, points to God in heaven. Every one of their Babylonian names points to a Babylonian idol. So when they're alone in their small group together, they're calling each other by their God-given names. So they pray. Daniel calls together a small group and they pray and God reveals to Daniel not just what the king's dream means, but what the king dreamed. And so Daniel takes out his Android because iPhones were the tool of the empire. And he texts Ariok, don't kill the advisors, take me to the king, I can interpret the dream. And so Ariok goes to the king, and this part of the story just kills me. This kills me. Ariok goes to the king and he says, O king, live forever. I have found a man who can interpret your dream. Ariok didn't find Daniel, Daniel found him. Typical politician. Spread the blame, take the credit, right? So Nebuchadnezzar says, can you tell me what the dream means? And we're going to go back to the text here, and this is verse 27, because I want you to hear what Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar says, can you really tell me what I dreamed? Daniel replied, no, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about, which is exactly what the other advisors had said. But they put a period right there. Daniel puts a comma. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about, comma, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come? Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Such a contrast between Ariok, the head of the secret police, and Daniel. Daniel's humble. Daniel is unassuming. He's deflecting all of the glory to God. So what's the dream? The dream that, that Nebuchadnezzar had, he saw this huge statue, enormous, dazzling, terrifying. The head was made of gold. The, the, the body of silver, the chest and arms of silver, the, the, uh, the belly and thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, the feet of iron mixed with clay. When I was a kid, I always thought the iron mixed with clay was like iron and Play-Doh, right? But I, I think it's more like ceramic tile, hardened clay. So he sees this terrifying statue with all of these different levels and layers and mixtures, and then he sees a rock a rock that's, that's obviously been shaped 
but not by a human hand. It's been it's like chiseled out by a, an invisible hand, and the rock strikes the statue, and the statue shatters into a million pieces, which ironically, hauntingly, is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar had threatened to do to his advisors who couldn't do the impossible. And then the rock grows into a mountain that consumes the entire earth. No wonder it kept him up at night. But what did it mean? Daniel says, that head, of, that head of solid gold, Nebuchadnezzar, that's you. You, God has made you the man. You're, you are in charge of all the earth. It's all yours. You're the boss. You're the head of gold. God has made you the man. And I'm guessing Nebuchadnezzar at that point is going, what did I tell you? Who's the man? I'm the man. And his advisors are all going, you're the man. Yes, you are. Thank you, Daniel. You're the man. But the rest of the, the, rest of the explanation, not, not so comforting. Because Daniel says the other layers represent other kings, other kingdoms. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar you're not going to be the man forever. There will be somebody after you and then somebody after him and somebody after him and somebody after him. But one of these days, there will come a king and a kingdom, the rock cut out but not by human hands, which will fill the entire earth and that king and his kingdom will never pass away. One of these days, there will be a new boss, and he will be the last boss. One of these days, there will be a new king, and he will be the last king. He will reign forever. Let's sing a couple of songs about that, and then we're going to come back and share some teaching. Let's stand. Who can satisfy my soul like you? Who on earth could comfort me and love me like you do? Who could ever be more faithful true? I will trust in you. I will trust in you, my God. There is a fountain. My very own Blessed Redeemer Who reigns upon the throne My rock, my shelter My very own Blessed Redeemer Who reigns upon the throne Who can satisfy My very own Blessed Redeemer Who reigns upon the throne My rock, my shelter My very own Blessed Redeemer Who reigns upon the throne There is beyond the azure blue He tinted skies with envy you and framed the worlds with his great mind. There is a God. There 
that song don't you it's a good song a couple of things here that make this part of Daniel's story a little difficult for us to connect with is when when chapter 2 opens Daniel and his three friends are facing a death sentence but when chapter 2 closes they're like nearly ruling the whole empire they've gone from you're about to die to what can I get you, sir? And it, that all happens in about 49 verses, which gives this particular episode in Daniel's story the same kind of feeling you get when you watch a, cr- a crime drama on, on television. I mean, on, on TV, the, you know, the crime is committed, and then the police investigation starts, and then the suspect is apprehended, and the case is closed, and the trial is won, and the credits roll. And that all happens in one hour, easy. Except life doesn't really work that way. My hunch is that in chapter two, it, it, it's, it's a lot like it is in those crime dramas um, that we watch, that all, all the action is compressed for the sake of time. The tension between the decree that all of the advisors in the kingdom are to be put to death and the resolution that everybody gets to live and happily ever after, my, my guess is that there's a lot of time in there that we just don't know about. It lasts a lot longer. And if that's true, then you and I can connect with this story because the tensions in our lives are rarely resolved in as timely a way as we would prefer. You may, you may even be living in one of those tensions right now. You've got, you've got some kind of family thing going on that you've prayed and prayed about and you're ready for resolution and it's kind of like a dream. You see the shape of the shadow, but you don't see the reality. Um, you, you may be struggling with a problem at work or in your marriage or with a friendship. Something's going on and there's this tension and it's not resolved. And you're wondering, why is God not as quick on his feet for me as he was for Daniel? My guess is Daniel was wondering the same thing. Why is God not as quick on his feet for me as he was for my ancestors when I've heard the stories about what he did for them? So the other obstacle standing in our way in terms of really connecting with this story is the fact that you and I are just not living under the same cloud that Daniel was living under. I mean, he had a deranged, despot 
sending out death threats. We, we may not be very fond of our politicians. In fact, we, we may think they're corrupt or crazy and certainly ineffective, but I don't know of any current politician who is dialing up the, so, the, the psychic um, hotline? What's that thing called? The psychic dream interpreter's hotline? Nancy Reagan did that, I think, right? But nobody else is doing that these days, and they're certainly not asking people to, 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 to make heads roll, literally, unless you're living in North Korea, I guess. But we've all had a boss that treated us unfairly, made unreasonable demands. We've had teachers or coaches or school administrators that treated us unfairly. Lots of folks have been affected by people who did not care how many other people they hurt in their scramble for power or gain. The lives of a lot of downline employees are negatively affected by people in C-suites who make decisions with apparent apparently no concern for what happens to other folks. All of us live under somebody else's authority. There is always, always, always a boss. And sometimes that position is held by a person of integrity, and if that's the case, then there's justice. But often, that's not the case. And so we all have to deal with injustice and unfairness at some point in our lives. In that sense, you and I are like Daniel. In that sense, this is our story. And there's some lessons we can learn. When, when Ariok shows up with that warrant for his arrest, the Bible says in verse 14 that Daniel handled that situation with wisdom and tact. It sounds like Daniel de-escalated the confrontation in order to gain time to find a solution. That's a useful tool to put in your toolbox. I mean, if, if emotions are running hot in a, in a scenario, it's usually a good idea for somebody to, to sort of cool things down, to de-escalate the tension so that everybody can have a good conversation. I don't mean avoid a hard conversation. I mean, kind of take some of the heat out of the emotion of it so we can talk. If you know who the boss is, if you know that God is ultimately in control, you can be that person because God's in charge and it's going to be okay. Then, of course, there's a, a lesson about prayer. I mean, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? After, after Daniel wins the brief reprieve from the chopping block, the first thing he does is gather with his friends and flee to God in prayer. Very often in Scripture, prayer moves God to do something amazing, something completely different with the situation. Other times in Scripture, God doesn't change, but we do. Either way. Always an excellent first response, second response, third response to pray. If you are in a tension right now in your life and you are not gathering with friends and fleeing to God in prayer to pray about it, you have not even started to solve that tension, to resolve that tension. But to be honest, I really don't think the point of Daniel chapter 2 is to give us handy strategies for dealing with terrible bosses or awful authority figures or people who use their power to hurt us. I don't think that's what Daniel 2 is about at all. That statue, the one with the head of gold and the shoulders of silver, and the body of bronze, the point of that dream was to teach Nebuchadnezzar that every earthly kingdom has an after this. Every mighty king will be replaced by somebody it's kind of a subtle joke in Daniel chapter 2. But every time one of his court officials addresses him, they say, O king, live forever. His dream was God's way of saying, you, O great Nebuchadnezzar, are not going to be the man forever. There will be somebody after you and somebody after him and somebody after him. Now, later in the story, Chapter 4, we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. Daniel will tell a different king, not Nebuchadnezzar, he will tell a different king, the most high God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men, and he sets over them anyone he wishes. That kind of puts our politics in perspective. 
And that holds true. What Daniel chapter 5, verse 21 says, holds true for every authority figure you and I will ever have to deal with. And if you and I are, you or I are the authority figures, it holds true for us. God is sovereign over every authority on the planet, and he will set over them anybody he wishes. Every president, every governor, every mayor, every boss, every preacher, every elder, everybody is temporary. Only God is eternal. One exception. There's one boss that will never be replaced. Which brings us to the last thing we need to see in Daniel chapter 2. You, do you remember what the advisors told the king? I told you to put a pin in this. The advisors told the king back in chapter 2 verse 11, no one can reveal the dream to the king except the gods. And they do not live among humans. That's not what God told the prophet Ezekiel who was prophesying at this very time. In Ezekiel chapter 37 God said, my dwelling will be with them. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. The, the Babylonian advisors said, nobody can reveal it to the king except the gods. They do not live among the humans. That's not what God told the prophet Isaiah. I dwell on a high and holy place and also with the contrite and lowly in spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. Earlier we talked about maybe being overwhelmed with all kind of stuff in your life right now to the point that you just feel low, overwhelmed, overburdened, overthrown, oppressed. You know what God says? God says, that's where I live. I live with people who are in that circumstance. The Babylonian advisors said, no one can reveal this to the king only the gods know that, and they don't live among humans. That's not what God told John. He told John the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. In his dream, Nebuchadnezzar saw a rock that shattered all the temporary kingdoms and authorities and systems and power structures and bosses of the world. It was to become a permanent kingdom, an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom that would never be shaken, a rock, a rock. On this rock, I will build my church, a stone. See, I lay in Zion a stone, a chosen and precious corner stone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone that causes people to stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Nebuchadnezzar was so blown away by Daniel's God-given ability to not only tell him what he dreamed, but to tell him what it meant, even when the news wasn't all that good for him. That he, he showered Daniel with great honor and wealth and authority. But the most important thing he did was not a thing he did at all. It's a thing he said. It was a confession he made. Surely your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries. If you and I believe and embrace that we can live in any tension we can survive any overpowering threat to us because our God is in charge here's what we're going to do I wanna, can, can you guys come on back up our, we're, we're about to take up our, our contribution our giving 
is a way for us to acknowledge that the kingdoms of this world are destined to become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. The kingdoms and all their economies are nowhere near as important as God and His kingdom and what He's doing. And then we're going to take our, commun- our communion time. We're going to share in our communion, which for us is a, a little piece of bread and a, and, a, and a little cup of juice. And these symbolize the body and blood of Jesus. They symbolize the victory that our king won over the two greatest enemies any human will ever face, sin and death. And he won those with both hands and both feet nailed to a cross. Both hands and both feet nailed to a cross. Let's praise him for that. Let's get our minds and hearts right to worship him and to receive this communion. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. week and going over the story and the statue and the dream, I was reminded from somewhere in my literature past of a sonnet written by Percy Biss Shelley that I think parallels so, where, so well what we have uh, tried to talk about today, and I wanted to share it with you if you would give your attention to this. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear, my name 
is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. If we know anything from history, we know that all kingdoms of this earth pass away. History has shown us time and time again that all kingdoms of this earth pass away. And folks, so will this one, right? This one will too. But what we're talking about this morning is that there is a kingdom that remains forever. And it is represented, if nothing else, in the cross. The cross will remain forever. And our hope is not in this kingdom. It is in that kingdom. And that's what we remember when we share this communion today. That God is our cornerstone through Jesus Christ and the cross. And that is where our hope is. Let's pray. God, impress upon us this morning the frailty of the things of this earth, the frailty of our health and even lives. And may we take hope and confidence renewed that the cornerstone of our lives is the sacrifice that you made through Jesus on our behalf. And we remember it when we share his body. Bless us as we take this bread. In Jesus' name we pray and all that agree say, amen. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the Do
takes away the sins of the world and who grants us peace. We give thanks for your sacrifice of both body and of blood. And we praise you for the gift that you've given us. And we ask you to help us to focus on your kingdom and not on ours. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name, and all that agree say, amen. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe your
to you. Um, a couple things as we close. Uh, there's a baby shower today for Ethan and Jessica Darby. That's 1.30 to 3. It's in the Mercy Building down on the corner. Uh, please come out and support them as they're expecting a boy in the very near future. Outback America coming up and a men's trout fishing trip coming up and some other things listed in the bulletin. Just make sure you pay attention to all those announcements. And we're going to close this morning with uh, John Perry leading us in the Lord's Prayer. So would you join him as he leads us in that, and we'll be concluding for the day. Let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.